dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Next to verse 9 in this old Bible of mine, which says, Thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. I wrote, at home, in God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us this morning to teach wisely and well your word and, and be a blessing to the folks that hear this. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday, after I'd already gone home Friday evening, I had something come in in my communications that said I needed to get something out of my campus office and get it in the mail Saturday. And yesterday, being not a teaching day, I said, I can ride my bicycle, so I did. <clears throat> Here and, and to the post office and back. And sometimes when you set off on a walk or on a bicycle ride, a song comes into your head. Now, I had spent Friday looking through our hymnal and another book about hymn stories, and I checked this morning. The song that came into my head was not in any of those hymn books. And yet it stuck in my head, and I, I almost had the whole thing figured out by the time I finished my bicycle ride. And I looked it up, and I, I make sure I have it right. And I'd like, it's brief. I'll share it with you. It says this. It says, Come to me, ye who are hard oppressed. Lay your head gently upon my breast. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Weary one, hither come, God is your home. Come to me, Jehovah gently pleads. Come to me, I can provide all needs. And my way unto green pasture leads, little one. Hither come, God is your home. And that's all of it. And I couldn't get it out of my head, and then I read Psalm 91 again this morning and said, this is just too good not to share. The word come, special word 
in our understanding of the gospel, we don't usually use it when we present the gospel. We say believe, we say receive, we say trust. But Jesus, Jesus occasionally said come. It's a word of invitation, obviously. Here's Matthew eleven twenty eight. A gospel invitation. It's not about becoming a disciple. Verse 29 is about becoming a disciple, but verse 28 is salvation through and through. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you're burdened by trying to do good works to please God, Jesus' word to you is, let me take that. I'll give you rest. You're working. You're not just rest. Come unto me. Jesus is recorded in John chapter 7 saying this after the seven day feast of tabernacles, on the eighth day, all seven days of the feast, they brought in water into the temple area for the sacrifices and for the people. But on the eighth day, they brought no water in. It was not a day of sacrifice. And so they're not provided with water, and that's the setting for which Jesus speaks. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He sums up the invitation, Come unto me and drink, he sums it up by saying, he that believeth on me. He says, that's what the Bible says. That's the whole thing. The Old Testament from one end to the other says, believe on the one that, come, that is sent by the Father. And when you do, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The same thing he said to this, the woman at the well in Samaria, he would have given you living water. Verse 39, John explains he's talking about God's Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. The Holy Spirit was not yet given. Jesus wasn't yet glorified. But there's his invitation. Come, believe in me. At the very last chapter of the Bible, again, John the writer, under God's hand, says this. After Jesus introduces himself again, I am the root and the offspring of Jesse, the bright and morning star. I'm the one who God sent to fulfill all the promises of the Old Testament. And then John writes in chapter 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. Now the bride is the church, the believers, that's us. And the Spirit indwells us, and we, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, are sent into the lost world to say to lost people, Come, he that believeth in Jesus hath everlasting life. The next phrase, let him that heareth say, Come. If a person believes, the first thing he ought to be doing is saying, We have found him that the prophet spoke of, Jesus of Nazareth. Is not this the Christ? Let him that heareth say, Come. The woman went back from the well and said to the men, Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Come see. And then the next phrase in John's verse 17, Let him that is a thirst come. The same that Jesus said, recorded in chapter 7. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And then the last telling of the same invitation, whosoever will, let him take. The first one, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. The second one, everybody that hears should say, come. The third one, let him that is a thirst come. Let come is a little less a command and more of, a, of an invitation. Let him come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Get out of the way. Instead of a being an imperative, a command, it's what is called an exhorted, exhorting subjunctive, a hortatory subjunctive. All those let us that are found in, in the book of Hebrews, those are 
first person plural, hortatory subjunctives. They're not imperatives. They are softer commands. Let us, and this is let him. Let him take the water of life freely. I I just had a thought of another place to look one more time before we go to the Proverbs. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 55, you might laugh if I called it the New Testament part of Isaiah. (laughs) The first 39 chapters of Isaiah are judgment. The last 27 are gospel. Isaiah 55, 1, Isaiah says this, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, no money, come ye, buy and eat with no money. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. There's no price, there's no work. It's just God satisfying the thirst, the eternal thirst. Come. I thought the song was worth repeating, and I hope it sticks in your mind. Come to me, you who are hard oppressed. Lay your head gently upon my breast. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Free from sin, enter in. God is your home. Can you see John leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper? Come to me, Jehovah gently pleads. We, we have been, had had the name Jehovah stolen from us by that group calling themselves the Jehovah's Witnesses. Before they were around, I think the name Jehovah was understood as a loving, compassionate synonym for Jesus. Jehovah gently pleads, come to me. I can provide all needs. And my way unto green pasture leads. Isn't that the 23rd Psalm? Weary one, hither come, God is your home. Anyway, we will now go on to where we're supposedly studying in the the book of Proverbs. I called today's study Short Topics, and the first short topic in Proverbs we want to look at is creation. Creation. The Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By understanding has he established the heavens. That's chapter 3, verse 19. God, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. John's gospel begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And, of course, the Word, in verse 14, is the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The Lord by wisdom, the Lord by the word, Jesus is the creator God. In chapter 8, toward the end of the chapter, verse 29, too far. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, Wisdom is speaking. Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Now therefore hearken unto me, O you children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Actually, I was supposed to start at verse 22 and go to verse 29. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass the commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. You recall in Genesis that God separated the land from the water, called the earth, the land earth, and called the waters seas. 
In chapter 16, we'll go on a little bit longer in creation, verse 4, the Lord has made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, he didn't create anyone as a wicked person, not even Satan. He created men and angels good, but with the capacity to choose. And Satan early on chose to be evil. And then Adam and Eve were tricked into choosing sin as well. But God made all things for himself. In Colossians it says, all things were made by him, the dear one of God, Jesus, by him and for him. And in Revelation chapter 4, the same thought is repeated. For thy pleasure they are and were created. One more verse here on the creation, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 12. The hearing eye, I'm sorry, the hearing eye, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Have you no sense? God made you with sense of your ear and of your eye. The last verse that we'll look at on the creation is in chapter 30, verse 4. <coughs> Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Oh, surely they didn't understand that. Maybe they did. The next little short topic is only one passage in Proverbs chapter 24. I call this duty and obligation, beginning in verse 10. Duty, obligation. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, those that are ready to be slain, do you know people around you might be lost? We knew it not. God knows what you're thinking, what you're doing. And shall not he render to every man according to his work? What a name we have of God here, a description. He that pondereth the heart. He's thinking about what you're thinking about. Good to remember. Well, there's a section I have here on envy. Envy, oh my envy. Chapter 3 again, verse 31. Envy not, envy now thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. We skip down to chapter 14. Toward the end of it, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy, the rottenness of the bones. However did I get this, this disease in my bones? Well, this says envy can make your bones rotten. I'm not saying I know that, I'm just saying it's what the Bible says there. Chapter 23, verse 17. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all day long. Sometimes people who get saved, newly saved, lose the glory of it because they see the crowd they did run with enjoying, they think, sin and they can't do it anymore. Not that they're not allowed to, but because it's not enjoyable anymore, God will put a sour taste in your mouth for sin if you're saved he will be thou in the fear of the lord all day long and let not thine heart envy sinners why, why is this in here because it's a tendency something we could fall into don't do it 
Don't do that. Chapter 24, be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. Their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of wisdom. Don't go with them. Just leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it alone. Verse 19, fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Chapter 27, verse 4. By the way, I don't think we should assume all these references to the wicked in the book of Proverbs are to lost people. These are very truths that apply to saved people that choose this evil way as well. Verse 4 of 27. Wrath is cruel, anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? <laughs> Thus endeth that short topic. Now a nicer one on forgiveness. Forgiveness in chapter 19, verse 11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger. If you're discreet, if you're wise, you don't let anger jump right in there as soon as you get angry. You put it off, defer it. It is his glory to pass over a transgression. We usually think, I'll pay that back. No, pass it over. Pass over a transgression. Chapter 25, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. There's forgiveness in that. Chapter 25, verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now, when we don't have attention to the custom of the day, we think differently about that heaping coals of fire. We think, man, we make it hot and uncomfortable for him. That's not it at all. It's just all positive. In those days, they didn't have butane lighters and matches and pilot lights and uh, little glow plugs to light up your appliances. If your fire went out, you couldn't make bread hot. You couldn't take the wheat and the grain and the water and bake them. Your fire's out. You've got nothing to cook with. So... If your neighbor's fire has gone out, you give him bread. If he's thirsty, give him water. And if he comes and says, my fire has gone out, you put some of your fire, coals of fire, in his basket lined with clay and he'll put it on his head and take it home and get his fire started again. For all of that, the Lord shall reward thee. Forgiveness, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. That's, by the way, found also, quoted out in full, in Romans chapter 12 in the New Testament, and the same explanation holds. They didn't mean and make them feel bad. It meant and help them, help them. So Jesus taught. The next little short topic is friendship. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Friendship. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. There is a friend that sticker sticketh closer than a brother. This is one of the little, the gist of one of the little signs I made up for my wild school bus children when I was driving a public school school bus. I put a sign on the wall of the bus that said, if you want friends, be friendly. They said, that looks like something from the Bible. I said, it's not. It's just, it's true. It surely is true. Chapter 27 Verses 9 and 10 says this about friendship. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Not, yeah, yeah, that's great. We love you. Go ahead and do it. No, good counsel doesn't always mean yes, yes, yes. Hearty counsel, strong counsel. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. Oh, man, I got trouble. Well, keep it. Better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. 
be friends, have friends. It works pretty well. In verse 17 of the same chapter, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. When I was a child, my dad had a grindstone that was hand cranked. And when he wanted to sharpen a wood chisel or some other edge tool, the boy was hired, that's me, to come out and crank the crank. And boy, when you put a blade against that grindstone, the sparks fly and fly. And the first time you do it, you think, man, I'm going to get burned. Those look like fire. But it, they don't. They're not hot. It's just fun. But you've got to keep cranking the crank. Iron sharpens iron. The last, not the last, the next little topic is God's delight. What is God delighted with? That'll be fun to know. Proverbs 11, verse 1, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Not referring to when we get a little older and might fall down. No, not that at all. But the balance or the scales used in public commerce to trade a certain weight of stuff for a weight of gold and a just a false balance god just doesn't like people cheating people but a just weight is his delight make sure you use the same weight weighing his stuff as you use weighing your stuff there a just weight is god's delight proverbs 12 verse 22 Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. They that deal truly are his delight. And sometimes we'll read some things here and there in the law that says that God is, don't do this and don't do that or whatever. But some things are said to be abomination to the Lord. And you know, Whether we're under the law or not, if something is an abomination to the Lord, I think we ought to stay apart from it. It would be bad to purposely choose something that God finds abominable. They that deal truly are his delight. The same thought about in commerce, don't cheat. Don't cheat. A little girl watched her father in church, and then she went to the restaurant with him, and came time to pay the bill, and he wanted to leave a tip on the table. He dug around and only found coins in his pocket. So he pulled out the coins and put them on the table. Little girl said, no, no, Daddy, this is a restaurant, not church. Ooh, they're watching. Chapter 15, verse 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Don't just get a little righteousness once in a while. Pursue it. Follow after like a hunter after his quarry, follow after, track it, track it down, keep on the trail. In verse 25 of the same chapter, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. I'm not sure that belonged in that section, but there it is. He likes widows. <laughs> verse 29 the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. You can tell God's happy with you if he's paying attention to your prayers. And chapter 21 and verse 3, skipping right along here, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to God than sacrifice. Just do right. Do right. Dr. Bob Jones used to say, do right though the stars fall. He said it's never wrong to do right. Well, there's a section coming up here on love. Oh, boy. Proverbs chapter 10. Love, love, love. Verse 12. Hatred stirreth up strifes. Love covereth all sins. That's a good idea. Don't be stirring them up. Cover them up. Put the fire out. Chapter 13 and verse 24. He that spareth the rod hateth his son, 
that he that loveth him chastens his behind. No, I'm sorry, chasteneth him betimes. I might have had it right the first time. You love your boy, you occasionally have to apply the rod of correction. Chapter 17, verse 9, about love. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. That's a good thing. He that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Did you hear? Don't be spreading what doesn't need to be spread. Some of it might get on you. In chapter 17, verse 17, just a little down the page, a friend loveth at all times. A brother is born for adversity. I don't know the whole story, but I remember the punchline. Someone in, in distress was rescued from it by his friend. And a little boy was watching and he came up to the man and he said, he said, I wish I, and the man said, he's going to say he wishes he had a brother like that or a friend like that. And the little boy said, I wish I could be a friend like that. That's what we want. What you be, not what you have. And in chapter 30, the last business on friendship, verse 18 There be three things which are too wonderful for me. Yea, four which I know not. Can't understand, too wonderful for me. The way of an eagle in the air. The way of a serpent upon a rock. I don't really want to understand that. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And the way of a man with a maid. Beyond understanding. A wise man once said there is only one way to win a fight with a woman. Is grab your hat and run. Yeah. My wife, I'm editing my wife's video class that she taught called Values for Women. And the other day I happened to catch the place where she said there's these special words that if they're used more often, resolve many, many problems. The two words are, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Powerful stuff. Well, the last little short topic for this, this session, mercy. Mercy. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. He that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Chapter 16, verse 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Mercy, chapter 19, verse 22. The desire of a man is his kindness. And a poor man is better than a liar. He says, is that mercy? Well, that's close. Kindness. Kindness. I once had a children's book that I read with my children. It was about King David. And it ended by saying in, that David, David is called a man after God's own heart. And it said, because he was kind. And to me, that's troubled you, because you know David's a sinner. He's a bad sinner. But maybe what God's looking for isn't us to be perfect as much as us to be like him in this matter of kindness. A man after God's own heart. You know he loved Jonathan, but after he was on the throne and Saul and Jonathan were gone, David said, isn't there anybody left that I can show kindness to? For Jonathan's sake. And they said, well, the, he had this crippled boy. He has to stay in his house. He can't get out and work. He's got a servant that's cheating him, but we don't know that yet. But uh, David said, bring him here. He's going to sit at my table. I'm going to feed him. The, the man who was crippled in his feet when he was summoned to King David thought, this is bad stuff. David was chased by my father's 
my, my grandfather Saul to his death almost. And David said, you're going to sit here. The servants you've got, they'll take care of your stuff, your house, your farm, and you'll just enjoy my table. He was kind. He was kind. Chapter 20, still about mercy. Verse 28. Mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. Mercy and truth preserve the king. And the last verse in this section, chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. There's a good principle there. You say, well, I I don't like that putting that forsaketh them in there. You know you don't have to forsake your sins to be saved. But you know you do have to forsake your sins to be saved from God's judgment in your life. The New Testament idea of confession, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The word itself is homologeo. The verb, confess, homo logeo. Logeo is like logos. It's a word that means word or to speak. And homo, like in other contexts, means the same. Speak the same thing. Confession is not saying, oh God, I made a mistake. It's saying, God, you saw what I did, and I know to you what you saw. You saw what put Jesus on the cross. You saw it as sin. No little sins. It's not confession just to make a list and say, there they are, God, I did it. There's a woman in the book of Proverbs that entices a young man and says, let's come on here now. I've already made my sacrifice so we can just, my husband's out of town, we can take our fill of love. That's not confession. Confession. That sacrifice was worthless. Whatever she did religiously was worthless. And if you confess your sins while you're still planning to continue in them, that's not confession. It's not New Testament confession. The book of Proverbs kind of gets it right here. You cover your sins up, you won't prosper. Now, Paul writes in Romans 4 that David said that blessed is the man that has his sins forgiven. His sins covered. When God covers your sins, that's wonderful. That's forgiveness. That's under the blood of Jesus. But you cover up your own sins? Here you are. He that covers his sins shall not prosper. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Well, I don't like that. I do. Don't excuse yourself to go out and sin some more. Don't do it. You want mercy? Take advantage at the Lord's Supper today. Take your time, before then even, to confess your sins. See them the way God sees them. Say them the way God says them. The littlest sin is shaped like a cross in the history of God. The littlest sin put Jesus through that cross. God's satisfied for it. It's under the blood. Every time you repeat it, you're calling for judgment for yourself. You don't usually look at this chapter, but James chapter 2. James is talking to believers who are behaving badly. Church people who are behaving badly says, stop respecting persons. Somebody comes in that's rich, and you say, oh, get up here in this nice soft soft pew over here. This is a good one. And you say to the poor people, you stand over there. Way in the back, sit over here under my footstool. You become judges with evil thoughts. God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom. You remember? I think James, although he wasn't yet a believer, was probably listening when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. 
He's made the poor rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He's promised to them that love Him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You, he said, James says, you've despised the poor. Church people. And you go out and there's people richer than you and they oppress you and drag you to the judgment seat. Verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you have respect of persons, rich man, poor man, you commit sin and you're convinced of the law as transgressor. Whosoever you keep the whole law and offend in one point, you're guilty of all. He that said don't commit adultery also said don't kill. You don't commit adultery, but if you kill, you broke the law, duh. So speak ye, church, believers, New Testament, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. He shall have judgment without mercy, which showed no mercy. Mercy rejoices against judgment. That's the context, that's the setting of this verse that some people says, say is a problem. It's not a problem. He's talking to believers, and he says this question, what does it profit? Believers, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works, wouldn't that be a miserable man? I know we love James, uh, Romans 4, 5, to him that worketh not but believeth not in the ungodly, on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We love the clarity of the gospel without works there. But wouldn't you hate to be the next door neighbor to that man that never did a single good thing? Wouldn't you hate it if they thought you were that man? You have faith, but you don't have any works. What is this question? Can faith save him? What's it about from that judgment that's coming? Not heaven or hell, but right now. Because of how you're behaving in the church, you believers. If a brother or a sister, believers in the church, are naked and destitute of daily food, and somebody says, well, go on away. Bother me. Be you warmed and filled. But you don't give them a blanket or a pair of socks or food. You give them not those things which are needful for the body. What, good, what doth it profit? What good is it? Faith, if it has not works, is... Useless being alone. Have any of you had a dead battery in your car? Uh huh. When you went out and lifted the hood, and there it was, where the battery used to be, there was just nothing, an empty spot, right? No, actually, the piece of gear is still there. It just doesn't do any good. It's occupying the space, it's sitting in the pew, but it doesn't have any juice coming out of it. Faith, if it has not works, is useless, doesn't do anybody any good. Because it's by itself. So in the church, people, show your faith with your works. And we don't, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go on. But James chapter 2 is a warning to believers, not that they might fail of heaven, but that their faith, without any good works, doesn't do the people around them any good. And there is a judgment coming of the believers for their works called the judgment seat of Christ. And James is giving a stern warning. All right, well, we have used up our time. I hope you remember how we started out here with the, uh, the invitations with come, come to me. I read Psalm 91. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. There's the truth of the gospel. Jesus said this to believers and unbelievers in a mixed crowd. He said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. And the last invitation of the Bible, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Come. Let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Father in heaven, as we've spent some time in your word this morning, we pray again that your words will ring and resound and ring again and resound again in our, in our ears and our minds that you invite us to come to you and you'll give us rest. Believe in Jesus. 
and he gives rest from our works. Father, we pray for the church service to follow and the time at the end of it when we will partake of the Lord's Supper. We pray that nobody will be kept from partaking of the Lord's Supper because of sin in their life, but that nobody will think sin in my life is just fine and I'll just keep on pretending. We pray that you'll not have to judge. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless. We have used our time.